Morning, thank you for joining us for this week's live Q&A. We've been getting a lot of questions saying, is the Flow Hive fake? It's been streaming in on our channels again, which is what we got when we first launched our crowdfunding in 2015. So what we're going to do today is show you up close and personal how the flow frames work and harvest some honey while we're doing it on this live stream. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below. Trace, our amazing customer support, she will read them out and we'll answer your questions live as well. So first of all, let's just have a look at the hive. This is the Flow Hive, my father and I's invention, and we've had it out in the world now for eight years. So what we did is we basically got one of the most common beehives in the world, which is the Langstroth beehive. Down the bottom here, it's the way it's always been, with bees going in and out of the entrance, if I move these jars aside, you'll be able to jump up there and have a look at that and just watch those bees doing their beautiful work, flying home with their pollen on their legs and their, their honey stomachs full of nectar. Okay, bees are just getting going this morning, so you can see the bees coming in and out. And if you have a look at the side window, you can see there's plenty of bees in the hive here. So you can see them there live bees, they're not fake bees, and beneath their feet is their, our invention flow frame that they have waxed up all the parts and they have filled the cells with honey and put their wax capping on top. Now let's look around to the rear window. Now this is a really nice view of a cross section of the frame. So this is our frame here, our flow frame invention, and this is a full one where you can see the bees have filled the cells with honey. This is one over here that we have harvested last week and here's another one we have harvested last week. So you can see the difference, you can see a bee going in and out, you see bees going in and out doing their work, waxing up all the parts, creating the right shaped cell for them to deposit their nectar and go through that amazing process of dewatering the honey. So to show you how it works, you've got these brackets here. This is a, a nice little set. You can hook them on up here if you've got small jars or you can go right down here if you've got really tall jars. And just for fun today, we'll show you how to harvest in one into one of these big uh, pasta jars. So there's our shelf there. And there's our big tall jar and what we're going to do first is take this little key access strip out of the top and our little cap there. Now if I then take this little cap out of the bottom I can insert this tube here and all I need to do is to harvest is insert this key and turn it. Now I'm going to do it a little bit if you wanted to harvest just a little bit of the frame you could just insert it a little way and you'd get just part of a frame of honey which is something that's really versatile with a flow hive you don't need to take all the honey at once you can just take as much as you need for your family and look at that it's already rolling the honey's just pouring out it's real honey you can eat it no processing at all the only thing that's got it out of the hive is gravity so that's really quite different to conventional processing of honey. And look at that, isn't that just gorgeous? So I'm gonna go ahead and insert the key the rest of the way now and turn it. Now it's not too hard today, sometimes it is. If it's too hard, just do it bit by bit in segments. And what we'll see is this honey stream really picking up and this gorgeous honey just filling our jar. Now the bees keep the hive at 35 degrees here for their brood, so that warmth is flowing up it's quite a warm day here too, so the viscosity of the honey is low, it's thinner because it's warm. So it is absolutely pouring out of that frame now. Mm. One of the nice things is you actually get different flavours from different frames. So if I chose another frame, let's do this one here, this looks nice and full. You can see the way they put the capping on. Ideally you're harvesting when the frames are nice and full and that way the honey has got a low enough moisture content and will keep almost indefinitely if you keep a lid on your jar like they have 
in the Egyptian terms for 3,000 odd years or so and the honey was still good. If you harvest early and the honey is a little bit liquid, don't worry, it just means you need to eat it or turn it into mead before fermentation might occur. So with this key here, I'm going to do the same thing, insert it into the frame and turn it. Now, I went for the full frame this time, which is tough to turn, so do it in segments if it's just a bit too hard for you to turn the key. But now, you can watch as the honey, watch this view, it's super cool. Maybe I'll get this key out of the way for you. Watch the way the honey is going into the center and down into the tube. So there's, you can get a cross section of what's happening actually inside the frame. And all that's happening is this is repeated all the way along the frame for about 80 cell lines. And we've got a different type of honey, a little bit of medicinal honey in there too. I can see some globules, see the globules of jelly? That means we've got the Australian Manuka here, which is the Leptospermum and Polygalifolia, and it has a jelly-like structure. And uh, that's neat because it's great for wound care. Oh, really different honey. It's got the, the wild quince or goya here that flowers in the springtime. So this honey's been sitting in that frame since the spring. You can see it's quite a lighter color than this one here. So today we're addressing a really common thing that's going on on our channels at the moment, saying the flow hive is fake, it's fake. Well, you decide for yourself. We've got uh, over 100,000 customers worldwide now in cold climates, in hot climates, in wet climates, in dry climates. The European honeybee Apis mellifera is incredible in its versatility of where it can actually uh, be. So in snow, in uh, tropical regions, it, it is so good at air conditioning the hive to, to make it all work for their brood nest. Now have a look at this. This is showing the, the honey is draining down. You can see these air bubbles here and this tube is full and it's just absolutely pouring out. And we've got a slightly lighter colour here with a very fruity flavour. Um, a slightly darker, almost, I'd describe that sweeter, slightly more towards the multi spectrum. If you've got questions put it in the comments below and just have a look at the bees here. This is the hive we're harvesting and the bees have hardly noticed that anything is going on. So you can just see them. I can understand why you think it's fake because we achieved something that just hadn't been done before in the world when my father and I spent a decade inventing and that was to get the honey out of the hive without actually disturbing the bees. And what we've ended up with is a very gentle process without having to go through that old process of taking the hive apart, getting in your bee suit, taking the frames out, taking them to a processing shed, cutting the wax capping off, putting them in a centrifuge, spinning those frames out, sieving all the honey, cleaning up all the mess, settling the honey, jarring up the honey, taking the frames back to the hive again. A lot of heavy, sweaty, sweaty, messy, hard work. So this has sidestepped all of that. You can sit here with your family, really enjoying the uh, process. And an unexpected benefit was you've got different flavors from different frames. And I really do recommend that you isolate the flavors frame to one jar. And that way you can enjoy the differences and take that story of the bees and the flowers they're foraging on to the table. Any questions? Yeah, thanks, Cedar. Look, here's a good question coming in from a chef, and it's sometimes the question we get asked quite a lot as well, is really happy to be able to harvest some honey, um, obviously to be able to cook with their food, but is allergic to bees and thinks that maybe they won't get stung because of the flow hive, the way of harvesting honey. So maybe we need to explain that a little bit more. Absolutely. So you can get quite aggressive bees. Look at that, this bee's just come for the honey, which is something that sometimes can happen. So I'll show you how to deal with that. I was licking the honey, not the bees. <laughs> um, so if you have bees around, it does increase the likelihood of stings. And you can get aggressive bees that when, you, when you're especially around the entrance of the side, entrance side of the hive, which we'll just show you again where the bees are coming in and out, you can 
get bees that are more aggressive and will protect that area and actually sting you. Now, if that's happening, the recipe to fixing that is actually changing the queen to a, a known genetics from a queen breeder. If you've got a nice gentle hive like this, you can get around the front of the hive. But if you do have um, uh, allergic reactions or strong reactions to bees, then you really just want to make sure you're well protected, wear your bee suit, wear your glove when you're around the hive. There's different sort of, like a lot of people swell, that's quite normal, but there is something called anaphylaxis, which you really need to speak to first aid professionals about to get advice on that. And that's the, the reaction that some people get from eating peanuts or some people get it from fish and some people get it from stings from insects. So that one is quite serious and uh, seek uh, professional advice from first aid professionals on that one. Great, thanks Ed. And another one, once the honey's harvested, how do the bees refill the frames or remove the capping, I guess, to sort of start the process all over again? Okay, so I actually have some examples to show you of that. And it's really quite um, interesting because we ha we harvested this frame here uh, on Friday, and you can see now the bees are actually ripping off their capping. If you see that capping there, ignoring the little bit of burr comb they've stuck up against the window glass, you can see some capping beneath their feet. Just go in again and show us the capping beneath their feet if you can. That is. A frame that they're halfway through ripping the capping off, rebuilding the cells, connecting the bridges of the flow frame parts together and refilling the frame with nectar. So you'll probably see nectar glistening down some of those cells now and the whole process starts again. So the bees recycle that capping. Now it was a bit of a wild card when we were inventing. I started off inventing ways to actually decap the frames in the hive because that's what we were doing in the processing shed in conventional harvesting we were using a hot knife to cut the capping off so i had these diaphragms inside that pulled pieces of capping off and i even tried using uh finishes that would actually stop the bees connecting capping onto a frame i was really focused on on the decapping in the hive but as it turns out the bees noticed when the honey drains from beneath their feet must be like a, a drum skin to walk on where there's no honey beneath the capping anymore. They realize that they chew away the capping, they fix up the cells, recycling the wax and the whole process starts again. But this is a great question from Claire. Do the bears sep the bears <laughs> do the bees separate the flavours in the flow frame or do they just do one frame at a time? Claire's noticed that their bees look like they're working on all the frames, but obviously then you get different flavours. So how does that work? So you will get a bit of separation, but you also get mixing. And sometimes you'll even get a dual tone honey coming out where you've got a dark honey, a light honey in one frame, which is pretty cool to see. But the reason why you get different flavours in your jars is because bees will typically fill the centre of the hive and work their way out to the extremities. So if it's the first fill of your hive, then you'll notice that when the bees are filling the centre ones, it'll taste different to when they're filling the outer ones, simply because the flowers finished and other flowers started and there'll be different flowers affecting the flavour out here. Now, then you come along and you might harvest this one, you might harvest that one, and maybe that one as well. You come back later, and then you've got honey from the springtime here, honey from the summer here, and then you're really starting to get quite a, a big separation of flavours in your, in your hive. Now, another question that people often, or another concern people have is, are the bees gonna go from the honey? Surely you can't harvest like that with open honey. And yes, sometimes they do. Sometimes you'll find the bees are hungry. Perhaps you've accidentally left some honey out and the bees are in a robbing mood. Perhaps you've got a dead out in your apiary and the bees have been robbing it out and the, and the bees are in a robbing mood and they'll find the honey behind the hive. Now, all you do to stop that from happening is cover the honey up. It's, it's not hard to do if you get a bit of, uh, this is a wax wrap, so it's recyclable, or you can use some plastic kitchen wrap and you just put it over the top here, being careful to make sure the part right under the tube is pinched together like that and around the jar. And 
that way your bees won't get in. It's quite versatile, works for any type of jar. But if you're doing that, obviously you're doing it with jars that can hold a full frame worth of honey. If you are uh, using small jars, then uh, it's going to be harder to do that, except for probably the last jar, because you'll be changing jars quite quickly. But you'll be there to shoo away the bees, or if you do get a bee in the honey, it's no big deal. I'll show you how to get the bee out. They can survive in honey for a long time, so it won't harm them. We're just so here's a, a couple he, of jars here's there, per seeds. Perfectly on call. Here's, <laughs> here's an example. So that bee's landed in the honey. It thinks it's struck gold. Oh, it got away again. We'll wait for another one to go in, and I'll show you how to rescue a bee if it ends up in the honey. But if the bees are coming from the honey, cover it up or finish up your harvesting and maybe, maybe save other frames for another time when the bees aren't hungry or in a robbing mood. See the wow. one. That's amazing. What are the flow frames made of? And is the of the plastic? And is the plastic toxic? Okay, so we put a lot of attention into that. Obviously, we are putting something artificial into the hive, and I'm quite a naturalist. So down here, we've actually got uh, wooden frames, as it's always been, with no foundation, no plastic foundation, nothing. And the bees are doing their job down here as they've always done. However. If, uh, when we came to inventing the flow frame, then the obvious choice to use was plastic. Now, I'm not a fan of plastic either in terms of one-use plastic in the world. I'll refrain from getting a drink even if I'm thirsty because I don't want that one-use bottle that goes straight in the bin. And I think the one-use plastic really does give plastic a bad name, as well as plastics that are really smelly and have a toxicity that imparts into whatever's inside. So plastic is, is, a, is an interesting topic. So what we did is we chose the very best food grade plastics. And then what we did was make sure that the, it didn't contain any BPA or, or BPS, which is these clear end plates. So we've got uh, polypropylene, which is largely uh, one of the best inert plastics you can get. And then here we've got a copolyester that doesn't contain BPA or BPS, the kind you'd use in your child's uh, drink bottle. Now I'm just going to have to change this jar because what we've got is an overflow. This is producing so well that uh, the honey is just full here. Isn't that gorgeous? So we're going to have to finish up with this harvest. <laughs> Look at this. You're going to need a taller jar seat to it. <laughs> oh my god. Look at oh. that. Isn't that incredible? That is just beautiful. And one thing you'll notice is there's no bee bits or wax or all of that cloudiness that you get in conventional extracting because it's just flowed out with gravity and left all of that behind. So I'm going to put the lid on that. And there we have, whoa, oh. a two full jar of honey. I'm not used to this type of lid. Mm. We might have to hand that to uh, Trace here there to go, go and dig that. Oh, a little bit out. I can see some cooking with that, mm. some chili bin honey coming on. There we We've go. We've got the same thing happening here really? with a, a jar that's so full because the bees have been doing so well. I wonder if we can fit this one on. Look at this. That's perfect. Look at that. So that one was a darker one. Slightly darker, notice that? So we've got a beautiful jar of honey from a single frame. So you get seven of these from your flow hive. This is the flow hive seven, we call it, with seven flow frames in it. Yum. Gorgeous. So What's going to be interesting now is we actually need to move this shelf up because or, or get a, another set of tall jars which we haven't got ready. <laughs> hold that for me Chase. I'll hold those. And what I'm going to do is just shift these shelves up to the appropriate jar height like this. So here and here. That's it. Beautiful. 
and if I can just get under you there, yep. we have the right height for our small jar. Ooh. Beautiful. So there's still more honey coming out, even though we've filled our two litre jars. You get that occasionally when the bees have done a really good job of drawing their, their wax out, making the cells even bigger and storing more honey in our flow frame invention. Great, Cedar. Questions coming in, and I know this came up in Australia or maybe a year or so ago about the supermarket honey. Um, do you think that the, the flow honey is better than the supermarket honey, and why can they sell honey so cheaply? Okay, so you've got quite a minefield there where often in the supermarket, unless it says raw honey on it, what they've done is pasteurise the honey. They've usually got honey from up, you know, a thousand hives or more, mixed it all together and then they've cooked it at a certain temperature for a certain time which means the honey will stay looking like that for a very long time and won't form crystals in there because humans have this desire to have things always looking homogenous. Now candied honey isn't a problem at all it just isn't a problem so when it's candied all you need to do is just enjoy that new texture that the honey has taken on candied and in doing so they've destroyed a lot of the beneficial vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, enzymes and medicinal properties of honey. So always go for raw honey and even better honey straight from your own hive. Now another thing that can happen and there's been cases of this in Australia and many places around the world is the honey gets adulterated by adding uh, corn syrup or sugar syrup of some form to the honey in order to make it cheaper and that way you're getting not only a bit of pasteurized honey but it's also not even honey when they've added corn syrup or other type of sugar syrups to it so to really know you're getting fresh raw honey harvest it from your own hive or somebody locally who's just harvesting straight from their hive to their jar Right, this is another question seeds I guess where people think maybe you know this is all fake or whatever because people want to know where are the bees when we're harvesting honey and why aren't we harming the bees doing this? Okay so the reason why we're not harming the bees while we're doing this is my father and I spent a very long time working out how we could get the honey out of the hive with, with the least disturbance to the bees and I'm very happy to say what we've done is definitely harms less bees than conventional methods of harvesting. So what we did is we created moving parts for the honey to flow down and then we spa paid special attention to how those parts move. So I've got a flow frame here and I can show you what we've done. We've got a whole patent about it, just about how to move the parts and shape them in such a way where the bees can't get caught in the mechanism. So if you have a look down here, you might notice that these parts have got a, uh, arranged in such a way that they don't quite touch. So when the parts move, the, uh, if bees are down the cells, the, when, the, when the parts move and come back together, they can't get their legs or wings caught. So we learned that very early on when we were inventing that if the parts touched each other, then you had this situation where if you did have some bees down the cells, ideally you're harvesting when it's all capped, but you can't always guarantee that. There might be a patch of the cell where bees are still down there working the frame. And what happens if the parts do touch is the bees then are down the cell and it moves up and then moves down again and they could get a leg or a wing caught. So what we did is we cre created a V-shaped gap, which you can see here if you looked really closely. And the bees have to bridge the parts with their wax, which means that when it moves and comes back, there's a gap left. And at worst, a bee could get stuck in a little bit of its own bees wax, and the other bees would come and help it out. So that was a really important thing when inventing the flow frame. Now I want to get back to the question of plastic because I didn't quite finish that. So we do get some people concerned about the plastics used and rightly so, there are a lot of not good plastics in the world. There's a lot of single-use plastics that are 
you know, should be banned in my opinion. I won't go and get a drink when I'm out often because I don't want to use that one use item and throw it in the bin. I think that is a waste of our world. However, plastic is an incredible product as well. It really serves us well if you look at our world and all of the things that are made medical or just in, in our lives. And this we've designed to last many, many years. So I think it's a suitable use of plastic. And the next question is, what about toxicity? So yes, there are a lot of horrible plastics that are toxic and they shouldn't be used around food. So what we did when we were designing it, we went, let's choose the very best food grade plastic. And this is polypropylene, which is widely used in food packaging. And here we have a copolyester at the end, which is used in baby bottles without BPA, without BPS. So there are things that honey shouldn't touch like metal. If you made this out of metal, then you'd get this issue where the acids in the honey would react with the metal and would impart a lot of flavor. So metal is off the cards. Glass would be a nice thing to make a frame out of, but it's pretty challenging because, and very heavy and very brittle. Having said that, glass can also impart chemicals into what's inside it as well. So basically everything in our world does have the ability to impart uh, a flavor or, or chemicals across. And so what we've done is choose something that I think has the least chance of doing that. Now let me show you what it looks like when the bees wax it up because after a while the bees, well the ants have found this, I've just got an example here, the bees cover it all in wax. So you can see the difference from here to here, what, what it looks like before and what it looks like after. So you see all of the cell parts are actually coated in wax. So your honey is existing in a little wax pocket if you like. So you, that's just a nice thing to know that your honey isn't actually sitting necessarily against the plastic, it's still in beeswax. So this is a frame we harvested on Friday and I pulled it out of a hive just to show you what it looks like and the bees are busy ripping off the capping and they haven't quite completed that. There's capping there that is still empty underneath but they've gone and gotten a whole lot of nectar and deposited it into the cells. If you can see that, that they're ripping along collecting a lot of nectar and really going through that process of dewatering and creating their honey in that. Now I'll show you what it looks like when the bees have finished capping it. So this frame is mostly capped. There's a little bit there that isn't, and there's a little bit there that isn't, but this is what it looks like when they put their wax capping right over the top. So hopefully that provides you with some reassurance about the use of plastic in the flow frame invention. And down in the bottom box, you've got conventional wooden frames and I like to keep it perfectly natural down there for the bees where they just hang their comb as they've always done in nature and they can size the cells perfectly for them. And I believe there's health benefits to allow them to naturally draw their comb in the brood box. And then there's a queen excluder here that stops the queen getting up so they're not using the flow frames for raising their young or raising their brood. Great seeds, it might be good, I know you mentioned this at the start, but we've, um, someone's just tuned in and wondering if you just want to take a little bit of honey out of the flow frame, is that okay without harvesting like the whole frame? Yes, if you're unsure, after all the honey is the bees food, it is their carbohydrate, it is what they live on, so if you're unsure then one of the versatile things with the flow hive is it's easy just to harvest a little bit of honey and leave the rest for the bees. And you simply do that by when you insert the key into this bottom slot here, if this is the whole frame worth and if you wanted to harvest half a frame then you would just put it in halfway and you'd get three or so jars instead of six or so jars from that frame and you'd leave the other half for the bees. So. That's really nice because three of these jars will keep your family going for a few days and you can come back, make a decision on whether the bees are bringing in enough nectar to sustain themselves and, and uh, depending on what's ahead you might decide to leave the rest for them if there was a long winter coming. 
<laughs> do you ever mix the two, the darks and the lights together, Cedar, or do you always keep them separate? So one of the beautiful things about harvesting honey with a flow hive is being able to separate the flavours and being able to bring that story to the table. So I prefer to keep them separate, but other people like to just harvest it all into a bucket, for instance. And you can do that too, but I think there's a real value in separating the flavours and that way you just get the joy of tasting them. And I love honey and I love the different flavours and I collect different flavours if, if I don't get hungry and eat it all. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I really do cherish the different flavours. Sometimes you'll get honey that's so dark you can't even see through it and sometimes it's so light it looks just like a very light yellow and all of the flavours and colours in between. A couple of people wondering about where we ship hives to, but probably best to contact customer support on those ones and they'll be able to let you know if we can ship to your country. Um, Suda, do you clean the flow frames and if so, how often? So the wonderful thing is when they're on the hive, the bees look after them and the bees clean the frames. They're very good at keeping their hive in a hygienic manner inside. So that's great. So there's no cleaning that really needs to be done apart from sometimes here, right, you get a little bit of honey build up. And I can't see it now, but let's say we've finished harvesting and uh, you came back and there was a bit of build up of honey in here. Now you may need to clean that if it's been there for a while and gone fermented or mucky for some reason. And you can do that just by putting a wet cloth on a key like this and just wiping it out, then you're good to go you're good to harvest, so very little maintenance on the flow frames. Now, people are finding that after about five years of use, the wax build up on the frames is starting to really like uh, close up this view, so they can't see as well anymore, and they're really wanting to clean the flow frames at that point. And the way we recommend doing that is you take the frames out of the hive after harvesting the honey, and you use a pressure washer and blast that wax off, hot water pressure washer even better you can feed a, a cheap pressure washer from a hot water service and that will clean even more wax off you can let them dry and put them back in the hive again set them to the cell open position the harvesting position when you are blasting the wax off close it, put them back to cell closed let them dry and install them in your hive again couple of swarmy questions. One is that do the bees ever swarm? Um, and that was from Janelle and then Jackie's asking how do you prevent too many bees in one hive so that they don't swarm? Okay great, so springtime is usually the time when bees will swarm if the swarming triggers occur in the hive and the primary trigger for swarming is not enough space for the queen to lay her eggs. So if you don't want them to swarm, which is good practice because you don't want half your bees to take off, particularly if they're going to land in your neighbor's place and perhaps annoy them or something like that, then what you want to do is lessen the congestion down here, provide some more real estate for the queen to lay her eggs. Now we call that spring management. So you get in your hive and you cut some of the honeycomb out. If you're doing naturally drawn comb like I recommend. It's quite easy. You just get yourself like a, an oven tray size tray. You take out some of the frames that have a, a just honey in them, which is typically on the edge. And you just cut the comb out it's right onto your tray. You take that away and you put that frame directly back into the center. And there you have new area for the bees to create the comb. And it also freshens up your hive and provides this natural cycle of frames from the center out towards the edge and it's good to do a couple of those each year just to give the queen more fresh real estate to lay and limit that primary swarming trigger. The best way I find to limit swarming is you do hive splits on your busy hives in spring. So if you're looking in the side window you can't see the comb because there's so many bees. You look at the front and they're boiling up at the front and it's springtime, the chances are your bees will be gearing up to swarm. So get ahead of the curve, take a hive split by taking some of the frames out of the bottom box and putting them into a new hive. Now if you don't want another hive, somebody else surely will. You might even find somebody will take a split from your hive for you 
which will limit the swarming and get them going in beekeeping as well. So it's a really good way to limit swarming. Well, see, you might be like me. I did a split on my hive and then I fell in love with the bees too much and then I couldn't give it away anymore. <laughs> so I'm becoming the crazy bee woman. <laughs> so Trace has... Uh, had a number of hives at home now. She started off with one and then she did a split, but she just can't give the bees away. So it does get addictive. There's a little warning there. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we found an example of a bee in a jar. I was trying to show you that earlier. Some people freak out that the bees are going to go for the honey. As you can see, they hardly have. We've been harvesting now with our frames for over half an hour and we have one bee in a jar to deal with. Having said that, cover up your jar if the bees are starting to come. So all you need to do is fish that bee out. They can be in honey for hours and survive, so don't worry too much. You fish it out and just pop it right back on the landing board. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, the camera's around there, I'm not, but let's see. If I give this a little knock, it'll probably fall off onto the landing board there and the bees will clean it up and away it will go without a problem. Any more questions coming in? Yes, Cedar. Um, do the bees just come to the hive? Do they just get attracted to the hive? Or how do you get bees to put in your hive? So there's, there's four methods for getting started in beekeeping. The easiest one is you buy a nucleus off a bee breeder. It comes in a little box. It's like a going mini hive with a queen in there laying her eggs. There's pollen stores, there's honey stores, there's brood. It's a going little beehive. Situate it where you want to have your hive in the long run. Then on the next nice warm sunny day, could be a week, could be a month, could be two months, depending. Then you can get out your bee suit and your smoker, transfer your starter hive, which is your frames, usually about four or five frames, into your flow hive brood box. Insert the rest of the frames in here. Put the lid straight on top. You won't need your super yet. Look after them and they'll grow. I've got lots of videos showing you how to do this. Have a look at thebeekeeper.org. That's a, an amazing online course. Expert from all over the world have uh, made amazing content for that. It's free to try and also an amazing fundraiser. We've created lots of high quality ecosystems already with 1.5 million trees planted from funds raised from the beekeeper.org. So we're very proud of that fundraiser as well. If you do want an online bee course made to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. So there is other ways to get started in beekeeping. So one is the nucleus. That's probably the easiest way to order that off a bee breeder. The next one is a package. And believe it or not, you can order maybe 5,000 bees in the mail, in a box, with a queen in a little cage usually, and some syrup in there to keep the hive going while it's in the mail. And your, your delivery person will have an interesting look on their face. They rock up with this buzzing box of bees. It's basically an artificial swarm. You'll shake that in, into your bottom box. You'll have all your wooden frames in there. You'll put the queen in and look after them and they'll grow from there. Another way is you can catch a swarm. Typical in springtime, when you've got a lot of hives in an area like this, that some of the hives will swarm. So if you happen to be near a beekeeper with a lot of hives, have a look out in spring, you'll see a ball of bees like this hanging from a branch. And it's fair game once the bees have swarmed from a hive. So you can go along and shake them into a box, look after them and they'll grow. Sophie, who's uh, also organizing some of the questions in the background here as you write them, she caught a swarm here on the mango tree and you can look at that and watch her catching her first swarm which is the first piece of beekeeping she had done. It's a fascinating way to start as well but you have to be lucky to find one. Another way you can get started is a bait hive and people often ask can I just set up my hive in the garden and will the bees just come to the hive? And the answer is not usually. Very rarely that'll happen unless 
you situate just the brood box six to eight feet off the ground near a lot of beehives in springtime. And then you might be lucky and a swarm will move right in without you having to do anything. So setting it up in your yard if you don't have a lot of beehives nearby and it's not springtime, very unlikely to get bees moving into your hive of their own accord. But that's called a bait hive. So there's four different ways to get started. Oh, we forgot the split. The split is, is one of the best methods, I think, because you're learning about beekeeping, you're taking a split from, a, from an existing hive. You might be helping them if they've got too many bees in their hive by taking some frames out and putting them into yours. Look after them and they'll grow, raise their own queen, and away they'll go. Great, Trisha's asking, this might be the caddy's time to shine. Trisha's wondering, where do you keep all your bits and pieces? Well, the great thing about the uh, flow hive is instead of having an extracting room, you've got this big centrifugal extractor that costs you thousands of dollars, you've got the decapping bench, you've got the hot knife, you've got all the buckets and sieves, you don't need any of that anymore. I'm so glad I don't need to use it because I can have direct, harvest directly from our invention into the jars like this. So it shortcuts a whole long messy process. So what you see here is everything you kind of need to keep your bees and harvest honey. Having said that, there's, you'll still need a, a good bee suit, your gloves, your hive tool, which uh, I haven't got in my pocket just now, but it's over here in the caddy. So if you do want a toolbox to keep the little bits and pieces together, then this is a fantastic uh, toolbox because it's made for flow hive beekeeping with a spot to put your smoker here. It's got a tool belt that you can take off and wrap around you if you like. It's got a hive tool, which is an important tool for beekeeping. It's got your bee brush, it's got your log book you can fill out, it's got an entrance reducer, it's a good spot to keep your tubes and anything else you might need. But as said, there's not a whole lot you need for flow hive beekeeping. You don't need that whole garage dedicated to an extracting room anymore. Um, so what do I need to create a, or get a population of canolan honeybees? Carnolian honey bees are Apis mellifera, the same as the European honeybee we all use for in our flow hives or Langstroth bee hives, etc. But they're a breed. You'll find bee breeders get excited about their breeds. Some of them will breed Carnolian, some will breed Caucasians, some will breed Italians, and so on. They all have different traits, but to me it doesn't really matter what breed they are. What you're after is bees that just have a gentle temperament and uh, that way you can be around the hive like this with your family without the bees really bothering you. But if you're new to beekeeping, wear your bee suit when you're around your hive. Make sure you have a gentle start and wear your gloves as well. Great. Um, now this is a good one, especially you might be able to hear our beautiful water and our fantastic email went out, a splish splosh or something about leaving out water for your bees. So the question is, do you need to leave water around for the bees to drink? You don't necessarily need to. They'll find their water. They'll fly a long way to collect water. And it's one of the last jobs the bees will do in their life is collecting water to use for evaporative cooling and air conditioning their hive. Having said that, if you are creating a water feature, then if you have a look at this one here, you've got uh, water flowing onto stones and splashing around. And that's, that, that's a really nice way to do it because the bees won't actually uh, drown in the water because they can just stand on the stones. So have a look at all those bees feeding. Where they prefer is the wet stones all around here. You can see them all just sucking away on the water and that'll give them water to take back to the hive to use for their cooling. Another thing you can do if you want to make a, a water feeder, and there's been some great experiments done by Fred Dunn, where I think it was titled, Bees Need Minerals. And if you are creating just a little feeder, then put some stones or something in a dish and the water you pour in there, put a teaspoon of salt in a bottle like this, and the bees will prefer salty water 
than just pure water. They'll go for either, but the salty one they'll prefer because bees actually need minerals just like we do. So how much of a tilt should the flow hive have, have when harvesting honey? So we've designed it for a three degree slope backwards and we noticed in the beginning a lot of people were messing that up and spilling a lot of honey and so on. So what we've done is we've put a level in the side of the hive. So you want that bubble roughly in the middle and that will give you a three degree slope backwards which is correct for honey harvesting. Just set it up like that and leave it like that. And uh, we've got a screen bottom board down the bottom here with a tray in it. And what it does is if water does drive in the entrance, it will, uh, what it'll do is flow right through the screen so it won't pull in the hive. So some people are worried conventional beekeeping, you actually tilt the hive the other way. If you've got a non-screen bottom board, the water can just flow out the front. In our case, it doesn't matter because it goes straight through anyway and helps you clean your tray because it'll put some water in it and you can tip it out later on. Or if it's only a little bit, it will evaporate away. So let's just have a look at this tray. We've just been harvesting. We've harvested two frames. And what I want to see is whether we've got any spills of honey inside the hive. And that's a concern that a lot of people have. And there we, there we have it. So you've got what is a little bit of honey after harvesting two frames that went straight through. And that's another reason to have your tray in while you're harvesting. You don't want that to fall onto the ground. Not a big problem. You can just wash that out and clean it. Uh, you can clean your tray first if you don't want to waste any. But that's a good mechanism there to catch any honey spills because you can't control how the bees cap their frames. Let's say they've put a, a bulged out capping up the top and thin down the bottom. They'll be ahead of pressure as it flows down. You might get some spills out. Well, they might put a higher viscosity honey low down and the lower viscosity, more runny honey at the top will be trying to escape quicker and you might get some spills out. So get your tray in while you're harvesting too. Bees are used to cleaning up honey. I used to spill so much honey in the hive in conventional harvesting. You crack the lid off, there'd be this rain of honey down in the hive and even flowing out the entrance. The bees are very good at cleaning up honey spills. So I haven't found it any concern, but if you do find it concerning, then just harvest less frames at a time and it'll quarantine it to a lesser amount and it shouldn't cause you or your bees any problems. Cedar, so do you need, need to use a separate hive tool for each hive or can you just sanitise in between them? It's a good idea to sanitise. The easiest way to do that is a blowtorch. So you'll see us lighting the smoker with a blowtorch and that same blowtorch you can use just for heating up your hive tool, giving it a wipe on the grass. Be careful, don't burn yourself, but that's a great way to sanitise and clean your hive tool. I'll give you a little example of that now. Now, this hive tool is pretty clean, but there's a little bit of wax there that, who knows, could contain pathogens from one hive. And when you work the next one, you don't want to spread that to the next one. So the way you clean the tool is quite simple if you do have a blowtorch like this. If you just heat that up a bit, that does a sterilization. And then watch what happens when I wipe it. I wipe it on the grass here. And remember it's hot, don't burn yourself. Wear your gloves. Clean. So that's an easy way to clean it rather than taking it to the kitchen and scrubbing it. However, you could take it to the kitchen and scrub it too. So I'm gonna do the other side now, just by heating it up like that, which sterilizes it and makes it soft for cleaning your tool and getting it all ready. Remember it's hot, but that's a handy tip for cleaning your hive tool after doing your brood inspections. Right. Cedar Troy's asking, could, could they add a shallow super to the top uh, for, to get some honeycomb out of? Absolutely. So if you want to collect honeycomb from your flow hive, there's a few different methods, but one is you could add a whole nother box full of just classic wooden frames to collect honey and that could be a deep box or a shallow box. You could also collect honey under the roof here by actually uh, taking the cap out of the middle, have a look at this, under here, 
is a cap and you can pull that out and yes that does expose you to the bees but the bees will then get up into this roof area when they're finished filling the super and start building honeycomb up the top and you can enjoy that honeycomb now if you don't want them to just go crazy under the lid you could quarantine them to a smaller area by putting some kind of container over here I recommend a Pyrex uh, baking dish so you can really enjoy watching them build that comb you can also collect honeycomb from the brood box like we were talking about earlier by taking some frames from the edge typically there's no brood in the edge frames and you can take that whole frame away or get a knife and cut out a shape of honeycomb to go into your cheese platter put the rest straight back in the bees will fill that in it's quite cool to see I better remember to put that cap back in or we'll have a whole lot of honeycomb up in the roof before you know it <laughs> oh now Robbie's got a question I'm not sure where Robbie's uh, tuning in from but new to beekeeping and noticed a sort of white greyish bee on one of the frames not looking so good but also noticed varroa mites in the hive could the varroa have caused that and I guess what does Rob what should Robbie do okay I'm not an expert in varroa mites but we will be in the next few years because it's now on Australian shores and slowly spreading throughout New South Wales at the moment. So varroa mites are a thing. If you want some more information on them, have a look at thebeekeeper.org. And I'm not sure what uh, has caused your grey bee, but uh, we need a little bit more information on that. Describe it for me. Is it alive? Is it dead? Uh, and uh, what, what characteristics does it have? Is it fully formed or is it partially formed? Sometimes you'll get brood that's ejected that can be um, a grey white colour where the hive has realised that the brood is damaged and has ejected it. Varroa mites will damage brood and a hygienic hive who's got natural varroa resistant will actually uncap and pull out those bees that are affected with varroa mites. So it could be that, but let us know more details. Right, so what are your tips and tricks for first time beekeepers? Well we get a lot of beekeepers saying why didn't I do this 20 years ago? So my first tip is just get started. There's always hurdles in life stopping you do what you want to do. But in the end at some point you just take the leap and get started and the easy first step I think is get your hive equipment whether it be a flow hive or any other equipment get your hive equipment and you're then started on the journey and the next thing to do is source your bees and we talked about the four main methods of sourcing bees earlier and then away you'll go and the main tip is make sure you're not getting afraid of your hive make sure you're learning starting with a smaller colony is a great tip because it's less daunting, you don't have to lift the top box off, you don't have to deal with you know, uh, 50,000 bees all at once, you might just have 5,000 bees just slowly building up in the brood box and get used to doing your brood inspections, get comfortable taking the frames out and quite quickly you'll realise that it's a fascinating world in here and you'll want to check out what's going on, you get in there more often and become a great beekeeper. If you want an online course with lots of high quality video training, have a look at thebeekeeper.org. It's an amazing course with experts from all over the world that takes you from square one right through to a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. Gets rave reviews and it's also an awesome fundraiser. We've planted uh, 1.5 million trees now from that to form billions of blossoms in high quality ecosystems all around the globe so we're very excited about the fundraising aspect of that course too but it's free to try have a look what what makes the flow hive more expensive than say your traditional hives so there's a number of things that make it more expensive and it's really the features of the hive and when you are comparing hives it's not apples for apples if you're just getting a couple of flow hives like this in the garden then you need to compare that to everything you'd need to do your beekeeping and harvesting in a conventional way. 
Conventionally, you'd need, yes, your hive equipment. You'd probably have multiple boxes because you're storing honey in boxes and harvesting by batch instead of storing them in jars like this on the shelf. So you're going to need maybe uh, four of these boxes for a hive to compare it to the amount of honey you can harvest and store in a season with a convention, conventional hive compared to a flow hive with just two. Then there's the extracting room. So you need a, a room for a start. So you're going to take over a room in your house or a shed or a garage. You're going to need to bee proof it. You're going to need to get some kind of extracting unit. Typically they're thousands of dollars. Then you're going to need the hot knife, the, the bench, the sink, the, uh, the, the buckets for, for sieving and, and settling your honey and so on. And then uh, gates for decanting the honey into the jars when you could just sit here with your flow hive, turn the handle and fill up your jars and bypass all of that mess, all of that effort and all of that expense as well. So it's not apples for apples and we are making a high quality product here in Australia and shipping to the world. So this is Australian made and we are cutting with a laser cutter so we've got very beautiful woodwork which you don't typically see in a conventional hive. And you've got our flow frame invention, which is something we worked on for a decade and we're making here in Australia from high quality materials as well. And we've got all the hardware included, which isn't included when you buy conventional uh, beehives. You don't get the hardware, you've got to go and get that. And you don't get the brood windows either, which is more hardware as well. And also, there's more features we've included on our Flow Hive 2 Plus here, starting at the bottom with adjustable legs, which saves you really putting a lot of effort into leveling the ground and all of that. Also gets it up off the ground away from things like cane toads and other pests that you might have in your area. Then you've got the ant guards here. And moving up to the hive, you've got a, some ventilation control. You've got the tray in here when you open the cover you've got a pest management tray that you can use for catching hive beetles or counting varroa mites and moving up we have then your brood box your harvesting shelves queen excluder and a beautiful gabled roof that a lot of people love the look of in the garden sure do Cedar, um, oh here's a good one, Esther's wondering, Lester's up in Queensland, a bit like us here, high humidity, lots of rain, the weeds are getting out of control, um, have you got any weed management um, ideas that are safe for bees, obviously doesn't want to use pesticides. Okay, I'm probably the wrong person to ask, I've ne never used uh, insecticides in my garden, I tend to go for manual weed control, you just pull out the weeds. There's also things like weed matting, you might put under your hive and then a whole lot of wood chip on top to stop weeds coming up through. Uh, we actually did this in this garden bed because we put this garden bed right on top of uh, what was weedy ground. So we, we put the weed matting down and then we filled it with soil to stop the weeds coming up through and then we could use it like a garden and plant what we wanted in here rather than continually being battling all sorts of weeds coming up around the, our hive. Right. Natasha um, was told that heather honey wouldn't work in a flow hive. Just wondering if that's true. So what you're talking about is honey that is thixotropic. So around the world there's different species that do have what's called a, a thixotropic or jelly-like property. And how that behaves is it'll set in the frame and our jelly bush is a local one here and in New Zealand they've got the, the manuka and that uh, will set in the frame. Now, if you get 100% jelly bush here, then you move the frame and not much comes out. It sets like jelly. So harvesting that honey is a pain, whether using conventional harvesting methods or our new flow frame harvesting method. It's hard to get the honey out of the frame. Having said that, we don't get many complaints at all. Occasionally you get some jelly in the frame. Earlier we showed you some globules coming out. There was some of those properties in here. We find if it's a mix, the jelly or heather honey will come out fine. 
but if it's 100% then it might stay in there. Not the end of the world, you can leave that frame for the bees, just the act of you turning the key and back again will stimulate the bees to strip it out and start the whole process of repairing and filling, filling it again and you'll likely get some runny honey next time for you to harvest. <laughs> See, so if I've just put a nuke into the flow hive, how often should I check them? So, as often as you like. If you are using naturally drawn frames, then check more often, every week or so, to make sure they are drawing beautifully on the comb guides of the extra frames you've put in. If you're using foundation, then still check, I think, because sometimes the foundation will come off the wires and you get some really bent frames. So a good idea to check often every couple of weeks in the beginning and that will also give you a great start in beekeeping because you're just working with a nice little gentle colony really watching how they go as they build out the rest of the frames. Cedar, can you use the flow frames in a horizontal configuration? Yes you can. I haven't had good luck horizontally I've, I've, I've got a few experiments at home and for some reason this configuration of vertic vertical which is the most popular method in the world uh, seems to work better I don't know for some reason the bees aren't so enthusiastic to keep going horizontal but by all means experiment I love experimentation send me what you've done and how well it's working for you um, Thomas is wondering, is there an advantage to install a 10 frame nuke when starting a new hive versus the 5 frame nuke? So a 10 frame nuke is basically a full brood box worth and it's not only the full brood box, it's the full 10 frame brood box. Here you have two main sizes, you've got the 8 frame brood box and the 10 frame brood box. So your advantage is you'll shortcut the time to when you put your super on and start collecting honey. So that's all. Either way is a good way to get started. Cedar, can you add a second brood box? Yes, you can. So you can add a, a second brood box. If you're using naturally drawn comb, I'd put it underneath this one. And that way the bees will hang down and build straighter comb than putting it on top. If you're using foundation, you can put it either on top between those two boxes or below whichever you like so it's popular in colder climates where you want a bit more storage for the bees for a long cold winter ahead and Cedar is that the reason why a few people asking like why you would add a second brood box so there's two reasons one is for more storage of honey they'll often put a lot of honey in that second brood box and that'll help them survive a long time with no nectar to most places is the long cold winter. So the other reason is to limit congestion in the springtime for swarming. So a larger hive will give more space for the queen to lay and that will limit swarming tendencies in the spring. Um, now this is the, the million dollar question you get asked a lot, Cedar, how long after startup before you can do your first harvest? So like many things in beekeeping, that always depends. If you have a booming colony, when you open the windows, you're seeing a lot of bees here in your top box and there's a good nectar flow, then it can happen very quickly. It can happen in two weeks, they fill the whole box. But that's one extreme. The other extreme is perhaps there's been fires, perhaps there's been droughts, perhaps your colony is a bit weak for some reason and isn't able to collect enough nectar to store honey for you as well. In which case you may not get honey storage for you to share until the next season. So sometimes you won't get any that season and sometimes it will happen in two weeks so there's the extremes but typically several months you'll be waiting once you put the super on before you've got honey to harvest. Sarah's asking at the end of the season and before winter when you would normally take off the honey super, do you take away and empty all the flow frames? In this subtropical region we don't take the, uh, the super off for the winter. We leave it in this configuration all year round. We get good honey flows in winter. You go to colder regions and it is typical to reduce the size of your hive for the winter, give them less area to keep warm. Now, 
there's different strategies. Some people will leave the super on the hive and just remove the queen excluder, allowing that queen to move freely as the bees that are hibernating in, in a ball can move up through the hive consuming the honey and the flow frames as well. Others would like to harvest all the honey out of this box and put it away in cold storage for the winter and put it back on in the springtime. After you've harvested the honey, how many times can you use that frame, the flow frame? So we've made them to last as long as possible. We are now eight years in since we launched our flow hive on crowdfunding and we're actually just coming up to our ninth year. I've got flow frames at home that are from a few years prior to the launch and they're still going. So it, I was just harvesting honey um, last week from those very frames. So hopefully they'll last as long for you. If you have any problems, get in touch and Trace will look after you. <laughs> you give us a call. <laughs> and how much does one of those frames hold, Cedar? I know you filled up one of those jars. It's a, probably a couple of kilos, do you think, in that jar? Yes, you get three kilograms of honey from one frame. That's when it's nice and full. So it will vary, but three kilograms is a, is a good amount to budget for. And that is just over two litres of honey. So make sure you're getting a two litre jar and it'll probably fill up usually about to the neck, but sometimes to the top and sometimes, like today, it'll overflow your jar. Um, are the bees we have here, are they stingless? They're not stingless but they're not stinging me because they are a nice gentle colony. Here's one here, let's see, it's just come for the honey. Now I'm gonna try and uh, see if I can get it to land. It's probably a bad idea, I shouldn't be teaching you to play with bees like that. When you get started in beekeeping, wear your gloves, make sure you protect yourself, wear a good bee suit, start the gentle way. As you start getting used to your bees, you can then start getting more up close and personal with them but bees can be aggressive and they can give you stings so just exercise caution when uh, you're starting out in beekeeping. Nice this could be a good one to end on seed people asking like what made you get into beekeeping? So beekeeping for me was kind of a family tradition my grandfather kept bees my uncles kept bees my uh, siblings kept bees, so it was just a, a, I guess, a family tradition. And from that, in my early 20s, I started keeping a small-scale commercial apiary, starting off with 30 hives and building up from there. And I was selling honey to the local shops, you know, in the conventional way. I just found it an incredible amount of work going through the conventional harvesting process and the bees didn't really like it much either and that's where the idea came from to harvest honey directly from the hive in a gentle easy way and I'm so happy even just for myself to be able to do this but even happier to be able to share it with you all around the world. And your kids see that they love it too don't they? They do. Kids love honey there's no doubt about it and they also get fascinated with the beekeeping bit as well. It's such a great educational piece to have as part of your family. Thank you so much for all of your questions, such great questions and I look forward to being here next week to answer questions for you again. If you've got things you'd like to know the answers to, let us know. We'll also be online helping answer some of the questions in text form and if you notice the answers to other people's questions please chime in, it's wonderful to see this community just getting in and helping each other getting started in this fascinating pursuit of beekeeping. See you next week. <laughs>